Hey guys, um, I'm Alex Conrad. I'm a staff writer at Forbes. I write about venture capital and startups. So I'm going to introduce our speakers. We have a CEO and a VC, and I'm going to grill them a bit about that relationship, the real talk of what it's like to work with an investor as an entrepreneur, um, how to trust each other. So we have a VC named David Packman, who's a partner at Venrock, will be joining me, as well as our CEO, Adi Seidman, CEO of you now. So guys, why don't you come on out here? Can we give a round of applause? Cool. I didn't scare everyone away before you guys got here. Oh, no, definitely only a not. few, only a few. Cool. So um, before we talk a bit about a couple really interesting stories from your relationships that I think will have lessons for the people here, um, why don't you just give you a little bit of context of like what kind of firm you are and what kind of company you're running so that this all just makes a little more sense as we drill in. Okay, so maybe Adi, do you mind starting? Sure. Uh, my name is Adi Seidman. I'm the founder and CEO of YouNow. Uh, YouNow is a social video network with over 40 million registered users. Uh, over the past year, we've expanded uh, running a live uh, social video app to multiple apps uh, utilizing a cryptocurrency ecosystem that we are building named Props. Uh, and uh, David invested in us uh, several years ago. Hi, I'm David Packman. I'm a partner with Venrock. We're an early stage Series A typically venture firm based in Palo Alto and New York City. And uh, we like to lead Series A rounds in exciting high growth early stage companies. Um, in 2013, 2012 time frame, it was sort of pretty clear what was happening in social products. We went from text to photos and video was next. Uh, Facebook had not revealed their strategy of copying every innovation that other apps had done. So one believed that you could launch um, new products around new forms of media and Adi was really the first at you now to do that around live video. Cool. So um, the purpose of this is to try to have everyone here walk away with a couple interesting insights um, that we are going to get to from, I think, two critical moments in your relationship as investor and entrepreneur. And I'm curious, of the people who are paying attention to me right now, how many of you are founders or entrepreneurs? Great. OK, so most people in the audience. Um, so again, we're going to try to get, get to a couple really tactical insights. But to do that, we're going to hear a couple stories. Um, and I think the first one is the story of, David, how you ultimately invested um, I know that you kind of were tracking this, you know, you now for a couple of years, right? So could you tell us a little bit about that? And then, Adi, I, we want to hear your perspective too, okay? Sure. Well, as I sort of mentioned, I think the, um, we had an investment thesis around the fact that social products would, first of all, they exhibit network effects, which makes them really hard to defeat once they get big. And we were looking for the next social networks to emerge. So you meet him. You meet you now, but you didn't invest for, I think, two years, right? That's right. So I had been introduced to Adi. He, was, uh, he had already tried to do this in a previous product, a previous company called Oddcast, which hadn't worked all that well. He has a, uh, he has a degree in user-generated content, literally. And so this had been a mission and passion of his, and I got to know him and started, started to learn about the product and the company. Yeah, so... Um... It, it became that uh, every six months or a year, um, David would actually ping me at exactly the right moment. And I was uh, very impressed um, because um, he's a partner. He inherently understood exactly what we're doing. When we would meet, we would talk about uh, my industry, our industry, in a, on an intellectual level, from a historical trends level. Uh, and I would get insights from David. And when I would leave his office every time, even though he wasn't investing, I, I got sort of, you know, wind in my back that we were doing something important and uh, something big. And, um, you know, I mentioned this to David. In the end, when he did invest, his um, valuation was actually not the highest, but because we had this... Uh, shared experience and I had so much respect to the fact that he really believed in our mission that for uh, years he was tracking us and having conversations with us. Um, you know, it proved out indeed to be a value add for a long-term relationship. 
uh, that goes, you know, beyond just finance, uh, but, you know, help thinking about the business uh, across the board. So for both of you guys, how do you, the entrepreneurs in the room, know that a VC is actually taking them seriously, wants to kind of maintain that relationship, and isn't just sort of checking off a box to have a chance to invest a couple years later if things look very different? So here's the, some of the dirty little secrets of VC. We always say, boy, what you're doing is really interesting. <laughs> Call me back when it starts to explode. Um, that, that'd be a great time for me to invest. So VCs always want to maintain the option to, of seeing your company when things are going really well. And your job is to see through that, of course, and to find the few of us who hopefully really believe in what you're doing beyond just, you know, maybe I'll get lucky when your company starts to take off. And so I think we were lucky because we, we both had a view that, that video would explode, uh, particularly on mobile and live. And I think we had some common uh, spirit around that. And th so there was a bit of a mission, or mission sort of purpose to us. But your job as a, as a founder is to find those who authentically believe in what you're doing, but are not just, you know, being silly and trying to maintain optionality. Yeah. And um, to David's point, once you have some traction, you start hearing from all kinds of investors all the time. And um, it's easy to note which ones are genuinely and authentically interested in what you're doing. Uh, and usually one of the signs is that it is a partner from the firm who um, has, you know, deep understanding and conversations with you as opposed to an associate or even a principal who has a sheet of paper and they have to go every quarter and check in on you and hopefully gain some numbers out of it so they can track you in some sheet. Um, David, should, a, should an entrepreneur panic if they're only hearing from an associate at a firm? You know, I, I feel so bad for associates and uh, principals, given what our friends on the stage here said. <laughs> But, I, but as, a, as an entrepreneur, you all know that you would much rather hear from someone who is a decision maker at the firm than someone who has to go get somebody else to agree with them. And so I don't think it's wrong for you to spend time with associates and principals and VPs because they're super bright, authentically interested people who want to find a great deal. But you do also have to make sure that they get through another hurdle, which is getting permission from the firm to invest in your company, and that's not going to be clear to you when you first meet them. So that, that's the downside, but I wouldn't say don't talk to associates, but you oh, got to go Of course, and stuff. early on, you're just excited to talk to anybody who is interested in your business, and uh, you'll learn a lot. They're smart people. So uh, before we move on to, I think, the other really interesting moment in your relationship, um, I'm curious, how did you guys mutually decide that the timing was right and that you hadn't sort of like missed your moment or something, you know, to actually put some money behind this relationship. So Adi started you now as a web product where you booted, you know, opened up your laptop and mostly young people were broadcasting from their bedrooms on a laptop. And there was like a queue to go live. You had to sort of raise your hand and say, I wanted to go live. There were only a few channels and the product was ho-hum. Um, but we both believed that there was something awesome here. And so Adi looked at his web numbers over time and said, this is kind of sideways. It's not exploding, but it's not failing. This mobile thing is probably the key to it. And this is at a time when mobile is just starting to really explode. And so he fires all of his web developers and goes all in on mobile and launches, launches a brand new mobile app. And he makes some changes. Anyone can go live at any time. There are no channels. Anyone can start a broadcast right away. And his numbers go like this. And he calls me a week after that happens. And we got together. I thought you magically knew somehow and you called me. So we remember it differently. All right. yeah, no, it's true. We, we track we track the numbers and uh, his numbers were exploding. And I said, what did you, you know, what did you do differently? And he told me he fired his web team and this is what happened. And so we started negotiating right away, right? So this yep. talk has been bad for VC associates and web teams so far, yeah. <laughs> um, you guys had a pretty rocky moment in your relationship more recently, um, and it kind of also takes us to the buzzy world of cryptocurrency a bit. Um, walk us through this kind of tension point, um, whoever wants to start with your version of the story, because it sounds like we might hear two versions which is great. And then we can talk a little bit about how you guys got through this. 
Well, I'll say that one of the awesome things about just the way VC investment in startups is structured is that there's mutually aligned incentives. Everyone knows on the cap table how much equity they have, and everyone's job is to try to increase the value of the equity. That's how we all ultimately will be rewarded. And so we never have to worry a year into this, hey, what am I getting out of this again? Do we need to renegotiate our deal? There, you just you figure that out at the beginning and you put it in a drawer and you never look at it again. And so there's trust that flows from that. I know that the entrepreneur's goal is to do the same thing for themselves that they, are, they do for me. And that is a beautiful, pure thing. We, I believe in incentives. What's happening right now, though, is some companies with equity are launching token-based products, launching cryptocurrency based products. And now there is a question of what is the relationship between equity and tokens? How do you do you give tokens to your equity holders? Well, as Adi will tell you in a second, he did exactly this and it caused a big question among all the shareholders. Hey, are we going to get tokens? What's the relationship between equity and tokens? And it was really the first time in our relationship where things started to get heated because there was not a really good answer for this. Yeah. And, um, Crypto um, economics, uh, cryptocurrencies, tokens are a new asset class. Uh, there is no um, uh, roadmap, there is no book about how to do this. We are literally writing the book uh, these days together. Um, and when we started out with the token, you know, who should get it? Employees, advisors, a foundation, investors common shareholders, how does it map to the cap table, how do you create that alignment of incentives, and these are, you know, uh, questions that very few projects and companies, uh, very few venture-backed firms in the world have attempted to answer. Uh, and so what we ended up deciding to do, and, and David was uh, gracious to uh, allow me to do that, is to um, agree that we have you know, so many things to do and so many challenges right now that we can allow for uh, another three months or six months or nine months to pass and uh, not necessarily attempt to be the only trailblazers who are going to invent what this relationship is going to look like and also learn from other industry best practices that are out there um, which are beginning to form um, and are helpful in our thinking about it. But the tension was, I said, look, you've got to make a decision and you've got to tell the board and tell the investors, here's how many tokens we're going to distribute out to the, to the cap table. And Adi said, I have too much shit to do. It's a complex decision. I don't want to make a mistake. The employees want to know the answer too. By the way, I want to know the answer too because I want tokens too, so you need to wait. And I said, but that's going to create an, a period of uncertainty where none of us know What's going on with the token? And he said, yeah, you have to wait. And I got upset. And so we had a rift for a couple of days. And uh, after a couple of days of uh, sadness for me, um, I don't thrive on conflict at all, uh, David called. And um, I was uh, uh, thrilled because uh, what David said, is it okay to share? David said, I just want you to know that um, I'm here to support you. In the end of the day, that's an overriding um, part of my job and part of what I'm here to do. And, um, you know, if we can talk about it and get to an understanding that we will solve this together in the future, then, um, you know, we can put this behind us. Um, and, and I think we had, a, you know, a, a coming together and seeing eye to eye about the, the matter. And, and I thought that uh, it was um, the greater man who picked up the phone. I used a, um, an ancient Chinese technique of, uh, no, no, uh, all, all that we ended up saying to each other was, um, hey, let me try to say what I think you're bothered by, and you try to say what you think I'm bothered by. Okay. Let's see if we see eye to eye. And lo and behold, we understood each other already, and so that was the basis for our understanding. Do you think that's unusual? Like, do you, th do you think that often entrepreneurs and investors are not exercising that empathy to just try to, like, imagine what the other side wants in that interaction because it seems kind of obvious but it sounds like you guys were drifting there and then had to actively do that to get back on the same page yeah if i, I don't know what would have happened if we didn't do that but it would, wouldn't have been as good as it is now um it's just communication right at the end of the day and trying to understand where we're coming from again i think it all stems from that simple observation that 
incentives matter, and if we're fully aligned, we never have to worry about these disagreements. But I was afraid that we'd work hard to maximize the value of the token at the expense of equity holders, and then suddenly there's a big gap between us. Do you think that at some point the investor-founder relationship inevitably just changes because you guys don't want quite the same things in terms of just how you make money, how you do well from that outcome? I mean, I think the only time that traditionally happens is when there's a performance problem at the company and the board or the investors have to exercise their only option, their only lever, which is to get a new CEO. <laughs> and that, uh, that's what causes a huge amount of stress, even though you have the same economic incentives. Um, so I guess one thing I'm curious about is how, how have you guys tried to remember or inform your future interactions you know, after that tension moment? How, how did that change your interactions after that? And, and do they look noticeably different, for example, you know, from the ones before crisis? So, you know, I mentioned to David when we were, um, before we went on stage and we were thinking about what we're going to talk about in this session, how um, in our industry, in the high-tech industry, in the VC-backed uh, world, uh, there is so much trust between the investors and the entrepreneurs that it's kind of unbelievable. It doesn't happen in other industries where, you know, a handshake is a handshake, a word is a word. Um, you're not dealing with uh, vultures. You're not dealing with banks. You're dealing with really smart people who inherently give you a lot of power and a lot of trust with a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, uh, David said um, it's because the interests are aligned, and, and, and we talked about that. And I feel like this episode that we had, not just four or five months ago that we just described here where we had this tension, the fact that we were able to come out the other side of it um, actually made the relationship stronger. And I find myself, you know, um, you know, the year before that, I would probably pick up the phone and consult David, you know, every three months. Um, and now it's probably happening every two weeks. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a testament to the fact that, you know, we've been through this fire together. It's probably like a, a marriage of sort where, you know, you got to fight in order to, you know, get to the next level. I would say, to, just to tie this all back to what we talked about at the beginning, if you find, as an, as an entrepreneur, if you find an investor who really believes in the long-term vision of what you want to do, in Adi's case, it's basically turn everyone into a broadcaster and a participant in live video networks, then you... You, you'll work hard to get through the inevitable friction points because you're really fighting for the greater good, not just to figure out some short-term gain. Do you think that you guys would, would argue don't avoid friction and maybe friction actually ultimately was a positive thing that people should not be afraid to have happen? Yeah? Go ahead. Please. I mean, some people prefer to be liked more than respected. The goal in this relationship is to respect each other more than we like each other. If we like each other, it's an awesome bonus. In our case, I think we do, or at least I like you. You don't like <laughs> me that much. Um, but respect matters more. And conflict, you can't just avoid conflict for the heck of it. Cool. Well, can we get a round of applause for Adia and David? Great.